from Ephesians 5, 19 through 20. Uh, these verses have special words for this wonderful youth choir as well as for the rest of us. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I want to, I know you've already shared Thanksgiving for this group, but the folks that we didn't honor are all the adults that are with them on tour. And they're all out here. Why don't y'all stand up for a minute? Y'all don't think I can preach a sermon in about 10 minutes, but y'all watch this. Um, <laughs> Last night I was at my house and uh, I got a, uh, a video of this choir singing in our chapel preparing for this morning and I shot it to my uh, good friend, their senior pastor. We were texting back and forth. Um, we're so thankful to have you guys. And what I want to say to you just real briefly is you, you remind me and you bless me today very personally. Because when I was your age, I was a part of a youth choir just like you guys. And we toured just like y'all did. We did a tour. You know how y'all went to Fort Lauderdale? We, went, we did a tour all the way up to Maine and um, up the New England coast. I had a lobster in uh, Augusta, Maine. I'm from Augusta, Georgia, by the way. And, um, and then we did another choir tour all the way out to Houston, Texas. And those are very memorable moments for me. I wouldn't have been sitting over here like you boys. I was a boy soprano. I had to sit over there uh, when I was on the choir tour. But I'm so glad you said yes, because these are memories that are formable and transformative. And you'll forever remember all the different churches and the different places that you've been. Every one of them has been a little bit different. Won't be like when you're at home tonight, right, with your congregation. Thanks for being with us. You know, we're in the summertime. We're not in a series. And I'm just getting a chance to pick up God's word with you and study one thing, one aspect each week. And today I want to talk to you about worship. You know, worship is um, an interesting thing because so many times when it comes to worship, if we get fuzzy about worship, things go south in our lives. And I don't mean just our individual lives, I mean our corporate lives. When people get fuzzy about worship, when they think worship is about one thing, when really worship is always meant to be about God at the center of it, when people get fuzzy about worship, some dangerous things happen. And that's why I wanted to talk to you today about worship, how we worship, what worship really looks like. What are some of those dangerous things that happen? Well, our worldview can get distorted when we get fuzzy about worship. Uh, we can get off track. Dissension can happen in, the, happen in the body of Christ. Sometimes conflict can occur. You know, when you get fuzzy about worship and things are not real crystal clear about what worship is really supposed to be, there can be a loss of spiritual passion. I think all of us probably know what it feels like to be maybe disconnected or feel far from God or maybe to feel like we've got a cold heart. When we get fuzzy about worship, it's very easy to start getting hard spirits. And so today I just want to talk to you about worship and how we worship, why we worship, and what worship really looks like. As a matter of fact, if you've got your, I always provide a message outline. I invite you to just turn to the back of that worship guide, grab a pen and the little seat back in front of you there. Maybe you would take some notes and I'm certainly going to invite you to maybe circle some portions of scripture and underline some things. But at the very top of your outline, you'll notice uh, that we're going to talk about worshiping God with a whole heart. But before we do that, let me just talk about what I would call the hows of worship. Pastor Stephen, how are we supposed to worship? And the reality is, when it comes to the how we worship, it can look so various and diverse. I've put some lists of some things there. I mean, you can worship in silence or dance. You can worship very traditionally or modern and contemporary. I hope you've been in worship before where there have been flags and banners and dance dancers. Maybe you've never experienced that before. Sometimes you can go to worship and it's um, very highly liturgical. And then sometimes it can be very intimate. 
Sometimes you can have worship in different languages, different cultures, different ethnicities. Sometimes uh, there can be solitude or celebration, sometimes repentance. There is corporate worship when we're together and there should be private worship when we're away from one another. But the key is, now listen, the key is so many times people get stuck on the how, on how they like to worship. But the reality is, when it comes to how we worship, the hows of worship should be rich and diverse. I remember because I went to school to do music, going on choir tour with my college choir, we traveled to about 16 foreign countries while I was in college. And I'll never forget having a moment when we were in Romania. We were in Romania and we were worshiping at a church very different from anything I had ever worshiped in before. There were I, there was iconography everywhere. There was different places. I felt like that I couldn't go, you know, places that were off limits for the normal people to go. I'd never been in a church where there were fences and you can't go beyond certain places before. And I remember being a very foreign place, but I also remember this. And this is, it was something that was sealed in my heart that day. I was in a foreign place. I was in a foreign country. I was in a church that was not of my tradition. But even as a 18, 19, 20 year old kid, I remember having this very heartfelt prayer. God, I wanna be able to worship you anywhere. And I don't want to let the things that I'm unfamiliar with, the things that are foreign to me, stop my ability to connect with you, even in this foreign moment. And the Lord heard that prayer. But that prayer has stuck with me because as a pastor, you can imagine, as, as, as the person who answered his call originally with music, I traveled all over the place. I'm in different environments and you are too. We cannot let the different howls of worship stop us from worshiping. So I just kind of want to move on beyond the howls. And if we can, just can we chalk up the howls that worship can look a lot of different ways and it can feel a lot of different ways and it can sometimes be joyful and jubilant and sometimes it can be penitent and sometimes it can be dance and sometimes it can be silence. Let's not get stuck and sidetracked about the hows. Let's talk about why you worship the way you do. Have you ever thought about it before? Why do you worship and why do we corporately Worship the way we do. You got your pen. I just want to make a few recommendations to you as the answers to that. One of the answers for why you worship the way you do or why we worship the way we do, write that one down. What I would call biblical and doctrinal understandings. We see the Bible through a certain lens and the way we read the Bible and the way we understand doctrine, maybe in the tradition, in our case, United Methodist, it impacts how we do worship and why we do worship. But secondly, uh, and by the way, sometimes that, you know, it's just the lens. That can be the order of worship. That can be the prayers. Write this one down. Sometimes the, the, the why we worship a certain way comes from our upbringing, our learned culture. You grew up in a certain place. Maybe some of you grew up in the church. Some of you didn't. And so sometimes the why has to do with what you learned and what you, how you worship when you grew up. Some of you grew up with hymns. Some of you grew up, all you've ever known are creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostle. That's all you've ever known. You, that's a part of your traditions, your culture, your learnings. It's why you worship the way you do. How about this one? Have you ever thought about the length of a service? This is where I push you to let me preach longer. But, uh, but have you ever thought about, well, why do we worship in just one hour? When there are other cultures, their tradition, their upbringing, their cultures... They worship a lot longer than an hour, an hour and a half, or two hours even, right? We're talking about the whys. Sometimes it's the way we read the Bible. Sometimes it's the, the culture. How about this one? Why do you worship? Why do we worship the way? The third one I would just get you to write in the blank is what I call the inspiration of the heart. Sometimes the why we worship is what's going on in our life. And in that moment, we worship because we were made to worship. Sometimes that looks like joy and sometimes it's excitement. Sometimes it's sadness. Sometimes we're overwhelmed. Sometimes it's a response. Sometimes it's in a setting like this, like a church, but sometimes it's in our living room or driving down the road listening to the radio 
or standing on a seashore or looking on the, from the top of a mountain. Some of the whys have to do with what our heart does in a moment. And by the way, this is a very good moment for me to remind you of something. You were made to worship. And so there should be this beautiful, private aspect of your worship. When it comes to who I am as a worshiper, you know the word, you might want to write this in the margin, the word that I try to hold on to for the worshiper that I am privately, the word is consistent. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I want to find places in my daily routine to worship the Lord. We should worship in our private lives consistently because you were made to be a worshiper. But then there's this other aspect of our, of our lives that is corporate. And I like to think of it this way. When we, you know, David, I, I, when I think about worship, I think about David, the, you know, the shepherd boy out on the hills making worship. I think he was such a great worshiper. We're going to read a scripture from David in just a minute. He was such a great worshiper. You know, my expectation for when we gather together is that the church would be filled with a bunch of Davids. And that we've been worshiping all week long, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, privately. And we can't wait to get together with the rest of the body. And what's going to happen then? Oh, it's not going to be some dirge. It's not going to be some funeral procession when we get together. No, we're a bunch of Davids. When we get together, there should be this beautiful vibrancy and explosion of worship. So let me just remind you, you were made to worship. Privately, consistently. Corporately, with vibrancy. It should be this explosion. How we worship can be various and rich and diverse. Why you worship the way you do might be very different from a person three states or three countries over. It might have to do with your biblical understanding, your doctrinal understanding. It might have to do with your upbringing, your learned culture, or an inspiration of the heart. But let me drive, to, let me drive home. I want to talk to you about the what of worship. What does worship look like when I'm at my best and I'm bringing my best and I'm worshiping God my best? There's a scripture that David one time wrote in Psalm 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. What does it look like, Pastor Stephen, to have a whole heart and to bring my whole heart to worship? If you got your pen, I'm just going to suggest three F's, and I want you to think about that for you today. Three words that start with S, and the first one in, the first one start is this, a heart that is forgiven. A heart that is forgiven. Now, earlier I said that David was a great worshiper, but that's not to say that David didn't fall and falter. He sinned, and as a matter of fact, the scripture I'm going to read to you here from Psalm chapter 51 is... One of David's hardest moments after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband and he'd been judged by God. And it's in that moment that he's reminded, even as he's trying to worship, that he's a sinner and he needs forgiveness. He cries out to God for forgiveness because he wants to have a whole heart. And he says these words, have mercy on me, O God. Why? Not for what I've done. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What I want to suggest to you is that there's none of us that's perfect. And every one of us needs forgiveness. Every one of us needs to be cleansed. And so if you want to have a whole heart, I think that's the starting place. What does it look like to have a heart that is forgiven? Can I tell you as a pastor, I, I've been a Christian for a really, really long time, but I still don't really understand exactly how God does all that He does in forgiveness. Let me explain that to you. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says when God forgives us, He will remember our sins no more. How does an all-knowing, how does an a God who is so brilliant ever forget our sins? I don't understand that. I just know it. The Bible says that my sins he will remember no more if I confess him and I can be forgiven. Hallelujah. I need that, don't you? How about this one? The Bible says he will take our sins 
And He will hurl them. I don't know how big God's arm is, but, the, but He will hurl our sins into the depths of the sea. This is beautiful picture of them being removed away from you so far you can't go back and get them anymore. I remember it was Corey Ten Boom who said, and then she added to that scripture, and then God goes up, puts a no fishing sign out there right where he hurled them. Don't you go digging them back up. By the way, how's your heart today? Is it forgiven? Today is the perfect day for you to say, God, I want to worship you with a whole heart. Like David, oh, have mercy on me, oh God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. I think part of having a whole heart is having a forgiven heart. Got your pen? Write this one down. Part of having a whole heart is a free heart. Jesus came proclaiming freedom, and he wants his children to be free. He doesn't want us to be in bondage. And guys, listen, there are so many people when it comes to church, religion, rules that are bound up in legalism. As a matter of fact, when the Son of God came on the planet, you know what He found? He found all kinds of people following all kinds of rules, but ignoring the most important thing, which is called relationship. God wants us to be free. And I think it breaks God's heart when we're bound up in bondage. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's liberation. Jesus talked about freedom over and over again. Matthew 10.8, Jesus' words, Freely you have received. Freely give. Hey, do me a favor real quickly. Take your hand. Everybody hold up your hand just like this. Right? Ready? You ready? I want you to take your hand. I'm watching your balcony. Hold up your hand. There you go. There you go. See, I can see you guys too. And now I want you just to ball up a fist as tight as you can. Tight as you can. Make your knuckles white. Make them, make them blood flowing out of them, if you will, okay? You got it? Hold it. Hold it there. Just how? Hold it now. I'm going to talk, okay? Hold it. This is a picture of tension. This is a picture of pain. This is a picture of tightness. I can't worship my best when I come in to offer all that I have as a whole heart like that. Now you ready? Hold it tight, hold it tight, hold it tight. Let it go. You feel that difference? You feel that difference that is there? God wants His children to worship with a whole heart that is forgiven. He wants His children to worship with a whole heart that is free. Lastly, write this one down. You want to have a whole heart? It's a whole heart. It's a, it's a heart that's full. For sure, there are times when I have worshipped out of my emptiness. For sure, there have been times when life was tough and the weight of the world was on my shoulders and maybe there was grief and there was pain in my life or in my heart. For sure, I have worshipped in emptiness. But that, not, that should not be the norm. That should not be what happens all the time. The norm should be this beautiful picture of overflow, of fullness in our lives where God is at work and He's doing things and we just can't help we can't hold it in. It just explodes out from us. As a matter of fact, here's a picture. Ephesians 5. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. By the way, I wonder if any of you did that this week, right? Well, Pastor Stephen, that doesn't sound like my normal life. Well, maybe it could be. Maybe it could be if you just were overflowing with worship. You were just, you, when, whenever you spoke, it was just psalms and hymns and spiritual words that flow out of your mouth out of praise and that's by the way to one another what does it say about how we're supposed to talk to god it says sing and make music in your heart to the lord by the way anybody can make music in their heart to the lord 
Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's this beautiful picture of living and thanksgiving and praise and adoration and just having this overflow, this fullness in your life. That's what it looks like to have this full heart, this whole heart. I, I love that scripture, Psalm 119, 171. May my lips overflow with praise. There's no, there's no perfect metaphor, but I want to give you a little metaphor as I close my sermon today. What does it look like to have a full heart? Well, it looks like a forgiven heart. It looks like a free heart. It looks like a full heart. It looks like a heart that's overflowing with thanksgiving and adoration and praise and joy. You hear that choir? We were made for so much more. We were made to thrive. Let me remind you of something, church. You were made to worship. And this week, you'll get a chance once again when you're all by yourself in your little private place to worship. To worship in your home, to worship at your work, to worship in your car, to worship on the walk, to worship. I want to challenge you as your pastor to do it with consistency. And I want to challenge you to do it with a whole heart. Forgiven. Free. Full and overflowing. And when we gather back together, may we be a bunch of Davids. May they be an explosion of worship. May it be vibrant and beautiful when God's kids get together. Hey, would you pray with me? Lord, even in this very moment, I'm keenly aware that any one of us could be in a place today where we don't feel like we have that whole heart. And so today, Lord, we just ask for you to forgive us, have mercy on us, wash us clean one more time, fill up our heart. We ask for freedom, remove the bondage, remove the tension. God, let your children be free. And we ask for an overflow, an overflow of praise and adoration. Help us to count our blessings because when we really see overflow is when we have our eyes open and we see how good you've been all around us. God, we thank you for your presence in this place. And we thank you that this very week, we get to do it one more time and two more times and over and over and over and over and over again to live out our calling as worshipers. Thank you, God, for your goodness. We pray all this in your most holy name.